that's a very valid point. Um, all right, we've already we've already gone thirty minutes on the show. Let me go on and jump into this topic. Uh, you own a well, co-own a minor league baseball team. Um, it is the the Lake Elsinore Storm. It's a Padres minor league affiliate in uh, in South California, Southern California. Uh, tell me about this. I don't understand how minor league teams work. I, I just want to know the the basics of this. We have one here sure. in Memphis that you know I, I've never understood the the financials. I don't understand uh, how the affiliation helps or or what it does exactly. Can you kind of give me? Just yeah, a, let, a let, general, let me explain it to you. Then no, you can ask, I'll explain. You can ask me some questions. So first of all, <laughs> okay. we have two kinds of minor leagues. We have affiliated and unaffiliated. Okay. But just so you know, in case you have some listeners sitting somewhere where they have a local team that's what's called independent or unaffiliated, that's a whole different business. And I, I we don't have time for that today. We could do it next <laughs> week or next month. The affiliated minor leagues are all teams that are farm teams of a major league team. By and large. There are seven levels of minor leagues from rookie ball up to triple A. And there are uh, 30 major league teams. So there's about 210 minor league teams. I'm cutting some corners and making some estimates here. Okay. But that's pretty close. Gotcha. So the Mem- Memphis has what? The Redbirds? Redbirds. Yeah. It's the triple uh, A for the, uh, they, the St. Louis Cardinals. Yep. For the Cardinals. So the Cardinals have seven minor league teams. It's a place where they can stash players who aren't good enough to play for them yet. And that's where high school kids that they sign after the draft or college kids that they sign after the draft get put someplace in that minor league system. They have If they play better, they play better, they get promoted. They play worse, they get sent home. Once in a while, they get traded around to somebody else's minor league team. Okay, okay. The, The owners of the teams have a business relationship with the major league team. So we have a contract with the Padres, and the Redbirds have a contract with the Cardinals. But we don't have to negotiate the contract because it's a standard form contract really negotiated between MLB and the whole world of minor league baseball, which has its own organization called the National Association of Minor League Baseball Team. So it's a standard form contract. So if the Redbirds get tired of working with the Cardinals and they want to become a Dodgers affiliate and that and that and and the Dodgers want them, they have exactly the same deal they have with the Cardinals. And the deal is this. We'll give you uh, players will give you uh, a manager, a uh, third base coach, a pitching coach, and a trainer. And we, the major league team, will pay their salaries. And you will provide them a field, you know, stadium. You'll bust them from place to place. And you will generally provide us a place for our players to improve or fail or get sent home. And we will control all the players. You'll control everything else. So, you know, if our shortstop in Lake Elsinore stinks, we can't fire him. We can't send him down. The the Padres have complete control over him. Uh, But we have control over the stadium, the hot dogs, the beer, and everything else. I once was talking to a guy named Larry Lucchino. You might know the name. He he ran the Orioles and later the Padres and later the Red Sox. He's a very smart business executive. And he said, when I was just getting into this, he said, Len, it's, it's kind of like you and Spielberg makes the movie. And what you do is you decide where the movie theater should be and how much rent you're willing to pay, how nice you want to make it, and what kind of food you want to sell and how much you want to charge for the food. And that's what you control. But Spielberg makes the movie. And that's, that's kind of what we do. We, we provide a place for them to play ball. And we attempt to sell enough tickets, enough hot dogs, and enough beer to uh, make some money or at least break even. Okay, so so the money side of it more so has to do with the facility itself and the concessions, et cetera. Uh, and, and you have to make sure that there are butts in the seats to make sure that you're making money off of that, right? Right. Okay. And, so, and, and I should say that, that most minor league teams uh, are closer to break even than they are to making or losing a lot of money. But also, most minor league teams go up in value over the years. So, you know, if you looked at my uh, 18 years as a baseball owner, um, I probably, you know, I make a few bucks one year, I lose a few bucks the next year. But after 18 years, the franchise is probably worth four times what it was worth when I bought it. And, th- and that uh, that is almost exactly what people said about Major League Baseball 20 years ago. Almost word for word, Major League Baseball teams 
other than like the Yankees and the Dodgers didn't make money. But even if you had a crummy team, the value of the franchise would go from twenty five million to fifty million to seventy five million to a hundred million. And you see this in a lot of in a lot of sports. The clipper price of the clippers went way up. Oh yeah. Uh, back when they back when they were terrible. And there's some magic about people owning owning sports teams that they're willing to pay and they're willing to bid against each other. So if you're trying to scratch your head and figure out why anybody would do this, I think the answer is that usually either they love the sport, which almost all of them do, or they're okay with putting up with mediocre financial results year to year because they know that when they sell, they'll make some decent appreciation. Well, that's okay. So this isn't necessarily baseball, but it, it kind of is in the, it's in the ownership realm. Uh, Chris and I have talked about this for years about the San Diego Chargers leaving San Diego and going to Los Angeles to be second fiddle to the Rams. Uh, Now they're going into a stadium where they have to pay uh, and they've got, you know, some kind of a sweetheart deal and whatnot. But I am curious, you know, if you are in a uh, a city like San Diego where you feel, you know, you are the team, right? Why would you go to L.A. to be second fiddle to somebody else? And we talked about how the the team's valuation in L.A. is worth so much more than San Diego. Uh, what what does that entail? How how does how do they become more valuable just because they're in Los Angeles? Uh, it, it's a it's a sad story, you know, for those of us in San Diego. I used to be a Chargers fan, and now I root for whoever's playing the Chargers that week. So <laughs> I can believe um, it. It's a very sad story. I was even even on the mayor's task force. San Diego set up a mayor's task force to try to find a way to keep the Chargers in town. So as you can see, we didn't do so good. We are but, not um, big Spanos fans. We we no, no, have these, talked a lot of hatred. No, they're, <laughs> well, yeah, they're, they're, not, they're not the nicest people in the world. But the answer to your question is because it's a bigger market, it's believed that people will pay more for luxury boxes, for season tickets, for advertising, promotion, sponsorship, and everything else. That's That's basically it. And, you know, it turns out to be to be mostly true. Now, the Chargers are, I mean, having two teams in the, in the city is a, is a strange situation. You know, if you move from, if you move from Podunk to, you know, a place that doesn't have a team, I mean, when the Cardinals moved to Phoenix, Phoenix might have been a better market than where they came from, which I believe was St. Louis. Um, and maybe that makes some sense uh, because it's a bigger, it's a bigger market and all those things are true. But they didn't have to share the market with anybody else. So I think what you have is you have two things going on. Los Angeles is a place where you can make a lot more money, but you have to share. So the Spanos family had to make a decision whether sharing it would, was uh, was going to take away all the benefits of being in the bigger market. But I mean, think about the Yankees. You know, they're, everything is so is so pricey there in terms of their relationship with their fans and their sponsors and their their advertisers that there's obviously more money to be made. True. The, 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 you know, the Cowboys, uh, you know, mint money. Uh, and you'd say, well, that's a big name team. But I would say Green Bay is a big name team. But you can't mint money in Green Bay, Wisconsin. A hundred percent true. A hundred percent true. Now, back to minor league baseball. You said that the, the Cardinals have like seven affiliates. Is is that common across the board? I mean, that just, that yeah, seems they have, like yeah, they have, so many. They have, well, they have triple A, double A, then there's high A, which is where we are, and low A. And those are the four. Those are the four that you might recognize where most of the most of the best ball players are. But there is also something called short season, which is a place where they stick the players the year they sign coming out of high school and college. Because by the time they get done with their high school and college seasons, you know it's it's May, and. Uh, Everybody's already up and rolling, so they want to put them someplace where the competition is a little slower and easier, and the coaches are a little more patient and get them, you know, attuned to playing uh, professional baseball instead of college baseball. And then there's rookie league, and there, there's a bunch of things they have near their spring training facilities that are for the youngest guys and for the Caribbean guys, because the the Americans can't come in until they're 18; they can't sign a contract. But the Caribbean guys can sign when they're 16. So we have 16 year olds. With tremendous, I don't mean we, the Padres have 16-year-olds with tremendous baseball um, skills for a 16-year-old who can't speak a word of English, never been in the United States, and they've got a lot to learn. 
And so they take them to Arizona where the spring training facility is and they have a rookie league and, you know, rookie uh, orientation. So if you add those up, you get, you get up to about six or seven and that's where we're at. Although I should say that, that, you know, there's an effort being made by Major League Baseball to reduce the number of levels. You may have seen it in the paper about six months ago. Yeah, we, we sure it's did. Been over, it's been overcome by the coronavirus, but some people in minor league baseball who are fearful of this think that the coronavirus will be the best excuse the major leagues can have for uh, knocking off some of those levels. But Major League Baseball thinks there's probably one or two too many levels. The uh, Kevin Towers... Uh, dear deceased wonderful man who used to be the general manager of the Padres would always say, can you please get rid of double A or triple A? Cause I don't need them both. You know, I, yeah. I'm, I'd be just fine with one of those and the rest of the, the rest of what you have. Most of his, you know, his peers now around are saying, well, get rid of rookie league and that other junk down at the bottom. I don't need that. But either way, what they're talking about is at five levels or six levels would be plenty. That is uh that is a lot of play. Do you have any idea how many players a Major League Baseball team is actually paying at one time? Just curious. Well, they pay the minor leaguers very little, but yeah, I mean, that should be. If you have seven teams, you know, in the middle of the season, if you have seven teams with uh, 25 players on a team and a few guys on injured reserve, what's that? Seven times 30 is um, That's a, a, 210. Yeah, that 210. That's sound right? Yeah. Good well, plus, plus the major. I missed the major leaguers at eight levels if you count MLB. So yeah, two hundred and fifty. But is you know they don't pay the minor nice. leaguers much at all, and that's a big controversy. Um, there was a lawsuit uh, claiming that they weren't being paid minimum wage because uh, you have to pay employees for travel time, so you got to actually pay them for every hour they spend on a bus. Yeah, I and, could. Uh, uh, I that, could see that. So college football yeah, uh, analyst Joel Klatt, was, uh, it, he always talks about his minor league experiences, and he said, we were traveling all the time. It, it was play yep. a game, you know, play another, or play, play two games, travel to wherever you're going next, play two more games, three, whatever it is, and, and you, there was no breaks, no downtime. He said more guys were on drugs, more guys had alcohol problems, et cetera, because – there was once the game was over, you had to find a way to decompress because there was no break, there was no time off. Well, yeah, well, it, and actually, um, one of the complaints that Major League Baseball is making about why they want to cut down the minor leagues is they say that the the bus rides are too long, and there are leagues like the Texas League, I think, in which the cities are teams are pretty far apart, and so you do spend like nine hours on a bus. And there's other leagues where you know it, it's more populated area, and the teams tend to be two hours apart, so. That's one of one of the grievances for Major League Baseball. Get rid of the longer bus rides. And then their other grievance is specific grievances. Other than there's just too damn many teams. The other specific grievance is some of the facilities are pretty pretty old and beat up. Oh, yeah. So uh, they're they're pushing pretty hard to uh, try to get rid of the old and beat up stadiums. Fortunately, ours is only about I don't know 18 or 20 years old. So. Uh, uh, we don't have an, I don't think we have any problems in, in those regards, and, and our league isn't too crazy in terms of in terms of travel. So, how, um, how many people does your uh, does your stadium hold? We hold about six thousand. Six thousand, that is significant. Yeah. The the one in Memphis hold. Chris, correct me if I'm wrong. It only holds like forty five hundred, right? Yeah, I don't think AutoZone Stadium is very big. Yeah, AutoZone Park is not huge. They they have also started a uh, a USL franchise. Uh, you know, but it's nice. Yeah, it's really nice. Like I mean, when it was built, it was now that's several years ago. When it was built, it was built as one of the nicer minor league stadiums in the country. Yeah, it is. It's insane. Yeah, I, I would say forty five hundred is small for AAA. Yeah, uh, but you know, if it's nice, nice, nice is nice is nice. You know, brings in brings in that, the fans and. We we don't fill our place that many times, so you know six thousand is okay, but we don't we don't need every last seat. I think that seats though. We also have like the entire right uh, left field is nothing but a big bluff, a big grassy knoll area. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know how they equate the amount of seats that is, or if they equate any. So it could be that it's got forty five hundred seats, and it's and actually got like got six thousand bluff, even. which yeah. might hold a thousand people. Yeah, that's that makes sense. Uh, Tim McCarver Stadium is the stadium that we used to have, and that wow, was for the the Double A uh, yeah. Memphis Chicks 
way back when. And Chris, do you remember what affiliation that was? The Royals. The Royals. Watch Bo yep. Jackson play baseball there. Absolutely. I, I remember I went to a game uh, against the Birmingham Barons and got to see Michael Jordan play uh, yeah. way back when. But uh, but yeah, it, that it was the whole stadium was was basically wooden. I mean, it was wooden seats. Yeah. It was. It was. That's an old stadium. Yeah. Oh, it was. Lynn, it was trash. That's an old stadium. <laughs> <laughs> it was, now, it was now, crazy. Now, do people, now, do people in the Memphis area root for the Cardinals or do they root for somebody else? Uh, they, this has been a Cardinals town for even longer than uh, than we had the Royals affiliation. I, I, okay. Yeah. All right. We're five hours from Atlanta. I'm going to tell you that uh, Atlanta, when the Braves were really four, good, yeah. four, six hours from Atlanta, five hours from St. Louis, there's a pretty big Braves following here um, as well. Those are probably the two local teams. And then you've got a lot of Cubs fans because for a long time, the only TV baseball we ever got was Braves on on uh, Turner TBS. and yep. then Super, WGN. Superstation Ted Turner, yeah, yep, WGN, yep. yep. And then and then you've got yeah. the the Chicago teams, and nobody wanted to be a White Sox fan, so everybody liked the Cubs. So those are probably yeah. the three. I don't know that I would say the Cardinals have more fans than the Braves around here. I. I might beg to differ, well, but we can argue about Unfortunately, in Lake Elsinore, <laughs> Lake Elsinore we're, we're almost equidistant between uh, the Dodgers, the Angels, and the Padres. So, you know, the folks who live in the community, some of them would rather see the young Dodgers making their way up, and others would rather see the young Angels. But we probably have more than our share of Padre fans right now. But it isn't like, you know, having the Yankees have a, a, friend, have a minor league team in Staten Island or someplace like that, where everybody around is a Yankee fan. And you do get a lot of interest from the real, you know, baseball fans to um, come out and see the young guys. And then they can go out, you know, go to the bar and tell their friend, hey, I saw the new third baseman. You know, he's a good kid from Puerto Rico. He's, he'll be playing third base in a year or two in the big stadium. Everybody likes to be sort of ahead of everybody else oh, in yeah. the information market. So uh, got that it right. helps if you have that if you have that crossover. That's It, it blows my mind. You're saying that that they have 250 guys on the payroll, even if they're, you know, underpaying a lot of them. Uh, it just, it makes me think about, you know, trade deadlines and all that. Like, why would you ever worry about trading if you've got that many guys to pick from? It's just, it's bananas to me. So it, Yeah, there's a, there's a guy, I mean, I don't know what they do in the computer age, really, but, you know, there used to be, and I think there still is, a guy with a huge whiteboard, and he's got the whole, you know, the whole thing laid out there on his wall. So, because you know people get hurt, oh, yeah. so you know if if our short, if our shortstop gets hurt, we have a choice. We we can we can put the they have a, the Padres have a choice. They can put the backup shortstop out there, uh, but he might and say a guy gets hurt badly, he's going to miss two months. They can put the backup shortstop out there, but he may not be a guy that they think is long for this world anyway. You know that he's just not, they're they're phasing him out, so they may promote. The, the shortstop from one level lower, who they think is a real, you know, up and comer. So now they have no shortstop at low A, so they have to find a guy to move him there. So it's like a big, you know, it, it, it's a big uh, superstructure of players at each at each position. And if you watch Major League Baseball closely, you'll see that there are pitchers, relief pitchers especially. They're in the majors for a week, and they're in AAA for a week, and they're back in the majors for a week, and back in AAA for a week. And that's to do with you know, saving the arms of your relief pitchers and uh, other guys getting hurt and whether the team that's coming to town has a lot of lefties or a lot of righties, but they're kind of bouncing back and forth. Somewhere in Padre land and, you know, Cardinals land, there's a pitching coordinator, and he knows he knows who every pitcher is in the system from the ace of the staff down to the lowest level minor leaguer, and he knows that if somebody disappears, this is who you replace them with. If somebody gets traded, this is who you replace them with. And, you know, if there's one guy for infielders, one for outfielders, one for pitchers, one for catchers, then you've got that, you can sort of master that whole, uh, that whole circus. That is, that is bananas. That is so crazy to me. That's, uh, that is one of the big selling points for the Redbirds here in town, uh, since they are the AAA affiliate. When the Cardinals need to rehab somebody or, or whatever, they send them down to Memphis for, you know, a week or two. And uh, and then they go right back up to the major leagues. But while they're down here, uh, I remember David Freeze was here for, I think, two weeks the year after the Cardinals won the World Series, and Freeze was uh, was the, the MVP of the World Series. And, you know, I went out to dinner with him, uh, myself and, and my buddy Zach, and it, it, 
everywhere he went, everybody in town knew who he was, and it was incredible to see. Uh, but as soon as he left, it went back down to, you know, you had 1,500, 2,000 people at the ballpark. Uh, but every game that he was there, regardless of whether he played or not, uh, they sold out every night. And that always tends to help. But, yeah, it, it, having a guy that knows every single detail of one position seems so insane to me because we're, you know, we're mostly football guys. Uh, in the NFL, you don't really have to worry about that much detail. But in, in Major League Baseball, it is, it's a whole different ball game. It's a whole different world. Yeah, but by the way, when Freeze was up there, the other major leaguers come up. It's a little added bonus for the uh, for the players in the minor leagues. Usually, they often take the players all out for steak dinners when they're down there, and uh, which they which they don't get on a regular basis. And Trevor Hoffman was was on a on a rehab assignment to our place several years way back, middle of his career, uh, and he didn't like the television they had in the clubhouse, so he bought him a brand new widescreen TV. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm betting he was pretty popular there for a while. <laughs> so ha- having the guys with the big contracts come through from time to time is, uh, you know, it works. I mean, Vlad- Vladimir Guerrero was down there. He was on rehab for um, the Angels, but we were playing the Angels affiliate. And Guerrero uh, asked for a meeting with all the Hispanic players on both teams. And he took them out in the outfield, and he had a little chat with them about, you know, playing baseball in the United States. I thought it was pretty nice. That's that's pretty cool. I I love guys that uh, that do more than than what they are supposed to do. You know, they have a that, top five favorite player. Oh yeah. So that's I I, I remember Chris talking yep. about him. <laughs> yeah. All right, we have uh, we have gone over fifty minutes. Uh, Mr. Simon, thank you so much again for joining us. We will uh, we will be having you back on again. I'm sure that there will be even more news that breaks that we are going to want your uh, your detailed opinions on. Um, Everybody go follow him on Twitter, at LynnSimon2. Uh, he is a fantastic follow. Make sure that you go and subscribe, follow, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Mr. Simon, thank you so much. We will, uh, we will definitely be having you back on. Thanks very much. Go online and check out our great, uh, our great hats and our great logo in Lake Elsinore. We sell a ton of them. It's, hey, you know what? We'll, uh, Chris and I will go ahead and tweet that out here in just a little bit. It's the eyes of the storm. They're, they're very popular. Oh, talk I to can, you later. I can get down with that. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you okay, soon. Bye. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Simon is such a, a fantastic listen, man. He's He's got so much knowledge. So much knowledge. Uh, Chris, anything you want to hit on before uh, before we head out? No, that's it. That is it. What a uh, what a great listen. Good gracious. All right. Uh, everybody knows the deal. WinningCuresEverything.com is the website. Go and check it out. Picks, previews, podcasts, videos, social media platforms. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Make sure you follow us over there. Uh, watch the show on Twitch. Watch the show on YouTube, etc. Make sure you are subscribed and you can always subscribe to the podcast, whichever of your favorite podcast apps you want to listen to. We are on it. I guarantee you. Make sure you leave a nice review. Jump in on the comments. Leave some comments for us. We would definitely appreciate it. Uh, Chris, this is uh, this has been a lot of fun. Tomorrow will just be you and myself. No guests. We are going to have an absolute ball. Hopefully, everybody will join us. Uh, we will see you all tomorrow. Thanks for checking out Winning Cures Everything. If you want to keep up with us, hit subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Visit the website at winningcureseverything.com or you can like us on Facebook or follow us at Winning Cures, at Gary WCE, or at Chris B. Giannini on Twitter. Share out the show, leave a nice review, and make sure to comment and tweet at us.